I'm Happy Caldwell, and I thank you for joining us for today's edition of Arkansas Live. You've seen the horrific images and heartbreaking scenes as Putin continues his attack on the people of Ukraine. I've asked to join me today Pastor Jeff Schroeder of Agape Church. He's the missions pastor, the missions director, and he lived in the Ukraine and ministered in Ukraine uh, for several years. He's joining me today to share his personal experience living among the people in Ukraine. So I want you to listen very carefully, and he's got some images, some pictures uh, when he served in Ukraine that'll be on the screen while we're talking, because I wanted you, I wanted him to put a face on the Ukrainian people. I've ministered there. They're beautiful people, and there are a lot of Christians in Ukraine. We're also going to share with you how you can save the lives of 200 Jewish people in the Ukraine that are desperately trying to flee to safety. So stay tuned. Arkansas Live starts right now. Jeff Schrader is here to minister to us today concerning Ukraine. Jeff, thank you for coming on and being a part of today's Arkansas Live. Well, it's sure a, a privilege to be here. I appreciate that, Pastor Caldwell. How long did you live? You and your wife, Amy, lived and ministered in Ukraine for how long? We were there five years. Five I, years. I, actually, I actually went there as a single man and then uh, brought her with me after, after our engagement and marriage. But now she's not Ukrainian. No, she's, she's not. No, she's American. But yeah. you all lived and ministered there, your family. Yes. Uh, you know, I've been there and ministered there, and I, I have to say I just kind of fell in love with the Ukrainian people. And uh, they're precious people. Yeah. And uh, they're at the receiving end of a madman right now. So I'd like for you to give some personal experiences. Uh, God called you in the ministry. You went to Ukraine. What, what was it like living there? It was like going back in time, you know, 40, 50 years probably. Wow. I mean, the cars, uh, the housing, uh, the clothing, the, the restaurants, everything just looked like you went back in time. And... And so uh, it was a great experience for my wife and I because we were just getting started in ministry. Um, interesting, we, we left America with $300 a month support. Our rent was $40. We rented an opera house for $50 a month, paid our translator $50. So we could live semi-luxuriously yeah. on $300. And so uh, if anybody feels called to the mission field, <laughs> there are places in the world you can go without you know, having a lot of financial support to begin with. <clears throat> Well, that's how you get started. You yeah. go uh, uh, with what you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, it, when you got there, did you speak the language? No, sir, I did not. They speak Russian, right? They or speak Russian, and in the in the western side, they do speak Ukrainian. Okay. But basically, from Kiev, you've probably seen the news where you have the river uh, basically dividing the country in two, and uh, on the east side is predominantly Russian. The west side is. Uh, Ukrainian. Okay. Uh, did you experience uh, any language barriers? I mean, did they speak English? Uh, when we arrived, hardly anybody spoke English. Really? And uh, we were just extremely blessed to have great translators. Yeah. Um, when I first went, we, we were invited into the, into the high schools and middle schools. And so uh, three, four, five hundred kids would get born again every single day. We'd invite them to the church. Uh, and my translator actually got saved. She was a 15-year-old girl, got saved, and really learned the English language supernaturally. And wow. uh, she translated for me the whole time I was there. <clears throat> so you actually ministered, and you spoke in English, and you had a translator that would translate it to Ukrainian or yes. Russian. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's wonderful. And do you miss being there? You miss the people and stuff? Oh, How oh, long have yes. you been back, been home? Well, I mean, we, we left the Ukraine in, in 97. Oh, okay. And then we moved to Italy. We lived in Italy for 15 years and then have been back in the States for 10 years. Oh, okay. So you've been gone a, a while. Yeah. Uh, I know this doesn't relate to what we're talking about, but is, there's a big difference between Ukrainian people and Italian people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And just, just the, the lifestyle. You know, I, I tell people all the time that in the Ukraine, uh, you know, I was a 23-year-old young man, didn't know a whole lot green yeah. as can be, but, you know, we had, we had a very large church and people getting saved all the time. And then you go to Italy, 
and uh, life's a lot easier. Yeah. But uh, you're also having to deal with a whole lot of other issues in getting people saved. Yeah. I, when I was there, I, I held a conference with some other ministers in uh, Kiev. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I, think, I think we held our meetings in an opera house. It seemed like to me it was a very beautiful structure, downtown Kiev. Of course, it's a big place. And the people were just so precious, so hungry, so um, genuine. And I, and I bring that up because... I know there are people that are watching the media and they're wondering what's the difference between uh, being a Russian and being Ukrainian? Well, I mean, Russia would like you to believe that they're, they're the same. Yeah. But the Ukrainians are, Ukrainians are extremely patriotic. They love their country. Uh, they love their language. They love their culture. It is very distinct from the Russian culture. They don't hate the Russians. Right. Actually, many of them have family members in, in Russia, and they travel back and forth. And, for example, many of our graduates went to Russia and planted churches and Bible schools. And so this kind of caught them off guard because they've always been extremely compliant. Yeah. Uh, as you've probably heard on the news, they, they disassembled all of their nuclear options years ago, expecting uh, that the world would back them. Yeah. And so I think they're, they're extremely hurt because they're not getting supported. Uh, do, do they look to the U.S. Uh, to help and support them in a big way? I, I think to a certain degree, but I mean, they, they are very independent. They're yeah. very strong people. We can see that. Um, it's a w wonderful nation. I mean, they're agriculturally rich. Uh, under the Soviet Union, they were considered the breadbasket of yeah. the Soviet Union. They, yeah. they basically fed the the world. Yeah. And uh, I really believe spiritually they are the equivalent of the breadbasket of that area too, because spiritually the churches are strong. Uh, there's been a very strong missionary influence, but a lot of that's been turned over to the nationals. And uh, it's exciting to see. Uh, before I first traveled to the Ukraine, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to uh, uh, to turn everything over to Ukrainians because Ukrainians will most effectively reach Ukrainians. Right. And so we felt like from the very first day we were there, we were working ourselves out of a job. We yeah. needed to do everything we could to train the people. And I believe that's why they're having success today because that's exactly what missionaries did. They turned uh, their ministries, the churches over to Ukrainians. Well, that's the Pauline method. He, yes. You, you, yeah, you do that. Uh, do you have any friends or families that are still in Ukraine today that you met years ago? Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of our Bible school graduates that are now pastoring are still there. Uh, actually, I just spoke with one uh, uh, the other day. Uh, he's in the eastern side of Ukraine uh, where they're being bombarded. Actually, I'm, th this war is unique than any other war that ever has been because of social media and the internet. Yeah. You go back to World War II and the citizens didn't have the capacity to be able to show you what was happening. Right. And even in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was the reporters that reported. Uh, now we have uh, nationals with iPhones and everything else that are taking pictures and plastering them on the internet. So it is definitely a different kind of war in that sense. Yeah, <clears throat> I know. Um when I was there, there were there was a there was a presence, a military presence, and I don't remember what years uh, that was, but I was always uh, impressed uh, by Ukraine uh, people. And I, my good friend Bill Bazensky was the reason that I went over there, and Bill had had been uh, medically um, helping the Ukrainian people uh, by providing machines and heart monitors. He and Jerry Savelle were going to build a hospital there. Mm -hmm. And Bill was, he was not only helping build it, but he was going to furnish all the medical equipment. And of course, Oral Roberts University was going to mm -hmm. send the doctors. It was a great campaign then. And it was a great move. Of course, Bill being Ukrainian, and he taught Russian at ORU, Bill wrote a book called um, Flee from Terror is when he escaped Ukraine back in the late 40s, early 50s, and how he was running while the airplanes were shooting at him. Mm -hmm. But he loved the people, and they loved him. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think the world is, 
developing a love for the for Ukrainian people. So uh, tell our viewers what, in your opinion, what can we do to support the people of Ukraine as Christians, as brothers in the Lord? Right. Well, I think first of all, obviously, we have to pray. Yeah. And uh, I know that's a cliche, and it's easy to say. And and you know, a lot of my Ukrainian friends are saying, "Yes, pray," but. There is so much more that can be done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I would I would encourage you uh, get behind what's happening here. Uh, uh, what Pastor Caldwell is going to be presenting here with these 8000 Jews that have the capacity to uh, be taken out of Ukraine and brought to Israel. You know, I was thinking this morning, the Bible says that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And you look at this war and you look at what's happening in the Ukraine and it's very difficult to see anything good, good coming yeah. out of it. But you know what, if 8,000 Jews can be returned to their homeland, that is a good thing because that is their destiny. You know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that and I'd, I'd like to go to uh, uh, this appeal to you right now. And uh, you'll probably see uh, some information how you can help save Jewish Ukrainian people out of Ukraine. I've served on the CUFI Christians United for Israel board for about 15 years now. We have over 12 million members worldwide, the largest pro-Israel organization in the world. Pastor Hagee is in Israel right now. And we work with a, a Jewish agency in New York that has identified 8,000 Jewish Ukrainians, and they want out of Ukraine. So this uh, organization is preparing to get them out. First of all, if they can get to a border, they'll pick them up in a bus, and then they'll take them to the nearest airport and fly them to Israel. But it's $2,600 per person, which is not bad to get out of Ukraine and get back to Israel. Christians United for Israel has committed to 200 of those 8,000. And uh, that's $520,000. And what I'm doing is simply asking you, if you'd like to do something for these Jewish Ukrainians, get them out of Ukraine, back to Israel, then you can go to John Hagee's website, jhm.org, or you can call 1-800-854-9899. And if you would like to sponsor one Jewish person or a family or whatever, whatever you can do, this is a way you can help the Ukrainian people especially the Jewish Ukrainian people, because the president of Ukraine is Jewish yeah, himself. Yes, yeah, he is. And so you can help get these people out of Ukraine, out of the war, into Israel. And you can send your donation payable to CUFI as Christians United for Israel. Not, Don't send it to VTN. Christians United for Israel, Box 659240, San Antonio, Texas, 78265. Five one four nine. So you can write that information down or you can log on to cufi.org, their website, or John Hagee's website. And uh, But that's what I want to do is appeal to you to help get some of these Ukrainian people out. Uh, Jeff, can you think of any specific in incidences where you and Amy um, got to know some Ukrainian people and families well enough to, uh, I know you've corresponded with these people, but that touched your life or changed your life or you had personal experiences with these people? Well, you know, so many of them in those early, early days, they were, they were extremely young. Yeah. So, you know, a, a church of a thousand people, probably 98% of them were under the age of, of 19. Wow. Uh, because we were going into <clears throat> the high schools and middle schools. Okay. And uh, so, you know, these these people were newly converted Christians and their parents were basically still communists. They didn't know anything else. And so uh, to a certain degree, as a as a, a young uh, male and female, uh, we became parents to these yeah. 
15 and 16 year olds at the age of 23 and, and 21 years old. But they really did touch your heart, their hunger for the Word of God. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, you would, we would go into the, the schools and you know hundreds of people would come to the front to be born again and we gave them all a Bible and every single one of, of, a, of them wanted us to sign that Bible. And so we just made it a, made a decision that we were going to do that everywhere <laughs> we went because we wanted them to, to know how valuable that word would be for them. And they've, they've, uh, they've embraced it and it's exciting to see them now today. Uh, standing up. Actually, I, I just got a, a message uh, this morning from one of our pastors. He's out on the street uh, with a microphone in a war zone preaching the gospel wow. and praying for his people. And so uh, there, there are cases like that of great courage and, and boldness yeah. and uh, What's his amazing. name? Can his name is uh, Dima. We call him Dima. It's Dimitri Kitschia. Okay, Dimitri Kitschia. Yes. So of those of you that want to pray and put a name to a face, Dima, D-E-M-A, pray for him. Uh, he's preaching the gospel in the middle of a war. <laughs> and pray for him for his safety, his peace, his family. Yeah, absolutely. And another young man, uh, uh, he's, he's the senior pastor of the, the church that we first started. Uh, we call him Chico because uh, uh, most males are named Roma or Roman in Ukraine and so because there were so many Romas we nick nicknamed him Chico but I've, I've talked to Chico quite a bit and uh, as I was talking to him last week a, a bomb went off just about two kilometers from his home mm. so that's why I say this war is different because uh, yeah. we thousands and thousands of miles away we can actually uh, see the building burning see, see the the bomb go off but you know they've basically lived in their basement for the last uh, nine or ten days and but other than the war, Jeff, what, what are the living conditions in Ukraine? You say it's the breadbasket of Europe and agriculturally they're supplying Europe with, with food. What are the living conditions there um, as far as families? Do they have uh, not just natural resources, but do they have community access activities, churches, community centers, mm -hmm. that kind of thing? I mean, yes, they absolutely have mm -hmm. all of that. It would not be nearly to the degree that we have it in America or even Western Europe. Um, like I said in the very beginning, it really was like going back in time 40 or 50 years. And, uh, you know, the, the, the transportation is, is very, very old and broken down. Uh, you know, now they have supermarkets and they have some more conveniences, but it, it's certainly still like going back in time. It's a very simple life. Uh, the government would give every Ukrainian family what they called a dacha, which was a, a, a little uh, garden out in the country. Oh, okay. So they would grow their <clears throat> potatoes, their carrots, all those things that could last throughout the year. And so, you know, most of them don't necessarily eat a lot of meat. Uh, they live on those potatoes and cabbage. And I know I was watching a news report and there were families that were volunteering. This was all in, in Ukraine. I don't know the city. And they were taking all of their antiques and their religious artifacts and they were wrapping them up to protect them so they couldn't be destroyed or stolen. Mm -hmm. And they were they had a big, I don't know whether it was an auditorium or a coliseum or something, and they were occupying the basement. And they were hiding all this stuff. <coughs> hiding it, it was on the news. <laughs> but they showed all the food that the volunteers were bringing. Yeah. These were... These were next door neighbors, you know, mm -hmm. but they were bringing it all to a central location. And they had one whole room, probably the size of this studio, with nothing but potatoes in yeah. it. I mean, 50, 100 pound bags, and they were stacked all the way to the ceiling. <laughs> Ukrainians can live on potatoes until Jesus comes back, I think, oh, because, uh, you know, they ha their popular soup is called borscht, and it's basically cabbage and beets and and potatoes, and, and that's basically what we ate every day of our, our first couple that's, years in the Ukraine. That sounds good, is it? It's very tasty, but uh, <laughs> it's tasty. when you come back to America after eating that for six months and have a pepperoni pizza, <laughs> your body doesn't agree with oh. that very much. But <laughs> I'd like to get the recipe for that. Tell Amy to give me the recipe. I'll, I'll, for, I'll do that. I, I like to try all that stuff. Okay, uh, your experience with the Ukrainian people how has that impacted your life today? Uh, when you first heard about Russia invading Ukraine, how did that impact you? 
it, it was very personal to me, just because I felt felt like all these people were my kids. Yeah, you knew them. Um, it's interesting. Uh, much of of the way the early years were at Agape, we really had an emphasis on missions. Right. And so we sent many of our graduates, ones in South Africa, ones in Kenya, several in, in Russia. And so many of them have contacted me because their families are still in the Ukraine. Yeah. You know? So imagine being separated from mom and dad and in a war zone you don't know. So um, it's been difficult for them. And, and for me also, it's been very personal. These people mean a, a lot to me. Yeah. And uh, we're we're just praying for them. We're we're doing everything we can to to help them. <clears throat> you know, um, when we, and, and of course we had churches all over the world. And Jeannie and I would go to these churches at least once every year or so. And we were in um, we were holding a Sphinx conference in Germany. I, I don't remember whether it was. Uh, um, uh, I can't remember all the towns. But we were in this auditorium up in the balcony, and they had a translator right behind us speaking into our ear as the uh, German-speaking people would talk. And we were singing, and they sang the same songs mm -hmm. there that we sing here. Now, this was back in the 80s. Yeah. We, we don't sing those songs anymore in the churches. We, no. We, we kind of abandoned those songs, but they were worship songs. And we were sitting there, and Jeannie looked at me. She said, Honey, you know what has just impacted me? Hearing these, and they were Germans and Austrians, hearing them sing uh, these choruses in Germany, we don't know what they're saying, but we know the melody of the song. Right. And we'd sing in English, and they'd sing in, in German. And she said, what I'm getting out of this is people are the same everywhere all over the world. Yeah. They have the same needs, the same desires, the same love for mm -hmm. Jesus. And uh, that really blessed her uh, because we've preached all over the world, every, almost every, every continent but one. And... We saw people in their native habitat, and we didn't want anything to happen to them. Mm -hmm. And when we hear of wars and rumors of wars, which Jesus said we would in Matthew 24, it really hurts us yeah. to see those people hurting. Now, Putin doesn't care, but I, I think, you correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Russian people care. I think they mm -hmm. care about what's happening to the Ukraine. Yeah. Well, I think they consider them their brother and brothers yeah. and sisters. I mean, obviously you have a few that believe the propaganda, and uh, but you have soldiers that are leaving the war zone and turning back and going to uh, back to Russia because they're saying we're not fighting this unholy war. I mean, they're and that's been our prayer. Let's pray that more and more of those soldiers will make a decision to put down arms and walk back. No, uh, I didn't know that. That's, that's And you know there are many Ukrainian uh, people that they see these soldiers and they'll they'll embrace them, they'll bring them into their home. I, I think it just proves uh, the love yeah. that they have for humanity. Well, what is the background of, of Ukraine? Now they're not they're not what you would call Russian. What, what, what's their history? Well, I mean you I mean they would be they would be Ukrainian. I mean you, it, they're I, I believe, I, I, I don't, you could go back and, and study this, but I believe it was the Apostle Andrew that stood on the banks of the Dnieper River okay. and baptized basically the entire population of, of Ukraine. So they've had great revivals of, of the past. Okay. Um, and they, they're very patriotic. I mean, they, they believe they have their own culture, which is extremely distinct from the Russian culture. Now, because of what, 60 years of communism, yeah. uh, a lot of that was lost, especially on the Eastern side, but um, they're, they're, they still have, uh, have their own traditions and all of that. Well, I, I want us to <clears throat> help them as much as we can. And uh, I'd like for you to put up the information about how you can help Jewish Ukrainian people leave Ukraine and go back to Israel. The website is jhm.org. That's johnhageyministries.org. You can call 1-800-854-9899. You can send your check or make a donation payable to CUFI. Don't make it to VTN. Make it to CUFI, Christians United for Israel. 
Box 659240, San Antonio, Texas, 78265-5149. Now, here's why we're doing this. Uh, we work with a Jewish organization. CUFI works with a Jewish organization in New York that said they can get 8,000 Jewish Ukrainian people out of Ukraine back to Israel for $2,600 apiece. Well, CUFI, Christians United for Israel, has committed to getting 200 Jewish Ukrainian people out of Ukraine back to Israel. In fact, Pastor Hagee is there right now. He went over to oversee this, and uh, I said, I would like to ask our viewers and partners of ETN, if you would like to give to help this um, mass of Ukrainian Jews get back to Israel. Genesis 12, 3 says, God will bless you. If you bless Israel, God will bless you. And uh, this, is, this is something that we can do. People ask, what can I do? You can help get Jewish Ukrainian people back to Israel for $2,600 per person. You might want to do one person, two, three, a family, whatever. Whatever you can give uh, would be appreciated. And this is over and above everything else that you're doing, your ties to your church, your support of other ministries. Don't take away from anybody. Just do this over and above. Uh, Jeff, you and Amy went to Rama Bible Training Center. Yes, sir. And you know the faith message, uh, prosperity and so forth. And I believe this is a time where all those that have enjoyed prosperity, believe in prosperity, now's the time for them to stand up and give mm -hmm. out of that prosperity. It's, it's not to be turned inward. No. It's to be able, and I think in Timothy, uh, it said, command those that are rich to be willing to share. Yeah. So that's what we're asking you today. Thank you so much for coming on. And taking You're welcome. A time out of your busy schedule and sharing your experience in the Ukraine. Absolutely. It's a privilege to be here. Amen. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Arkansas Alive. And uh, I encourage you to stay tuned all week as we continue to emphasize um, what's going on, Bible prophecy, end time events, as we see Russia uh, invading Ukraine. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and wherever you're watching, too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.